All right, we're going to start. Welcome everybody to the uh, seventh uh, Gardeners and Growers workshop for 12th of March, 2017. And as usual, we just go through the different avenues for uh, gaining some additional teaching. So that's through the uh, weekly private agricultural teaching. And there it's just a case of sending an email through if you're wanting to uh, join that teach private teaching and then uh, join as a private student and you can get access to all the uh, workshops that Mr. Takesh has done since 2015. And that's essentially where we have uh, gotten all our information and to produce these workshops is through all those uh, 2015 workshops that Mr. Takesh has uh, uh, done in Italy there and um, it's a great resource for those that really want to uh, gain more knowledge and, and more insight to go and study for themselves. And then of course the three books. Um, it is also highly invaluable for those that wanting to learn more information on, on the plasma. All right, so with today's presentation I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. She's going to be doing all of it today. So here we go. Hi, everybody. And I decided I was going to do the teaching today because um, being the uh, woo-woo lady that I am and have always talked to my plants, um, I had decided that it was one of the important factors to understand when we first started delving into how to how to feed the plants and um, how it tied in with emotion and soul and physicality and so um, I uh, pushed us to start delving into this quite early on when we got into our agriculture teachings and um, this is where we um, where we gained our knowledge and put all the pieces together. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give a little bit of history and a little bit of a lesson on the human body first because Mr. Kesh has taught a lot on, on the human body and how we understand the various ganses and how the field strengths work. And so once we've done that, we can then relate it to the plants and how it works with them and how we manage to have such good interaction with the plants. So, first of all, we're going to put our physical body into perspective. When we look at our bodies, um, it is essentially the electron part of an atom. And the electron is a very tiny little piece of the atom. And when we compare and, and understand as above, so below, we realize that there's a neutron, proton, and electron. And when we see how our bodies fit into this equation, um, we realize that... Um, Jimmy, you've now frozen this, sorry to say. Sorry. Um, just got to fiddle with the computer here a second. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so when we understand that the field strengths of the proton and electron combined are actually the approximate field strength of a neutron. This is sort of basic plasma physics and normal atom stuff. And so when we look at how this works, um, we start understanding that um, our physical body is a very tiny little piece of the total us as a reactor or an atom. Our emotion is as if it was the proton and our soul is like the neutron, which is the strongest part. And when you add the emotion and physical body together, you get an approximate amount of the strength of the soul. 
So that's an important thing to understand. And our physical body, body is a plasma against reactor. And so our soul is the, the core, which is the strongest part. The proton is our emotion and the electron is our physicality. So our physicality is a minor, a minor little piece surrounding our soul and emotion. Um, so we are the Gantz reactor with many star formations and our emotion is the primary field which, field which interfaces between the physicality and the soul. And um, so this is how everything works in the universe. And so um, I need to ask if anybody underst doesn't understand that or if they have any questions about that at the moment. Okay, we're all good on that. We're going to go on to the next part. Um, so we're going to look at the human body and field interactions. Um, and we told that we receive all our nutritional needs from the foods that we eat. Um, that is the current understanding, but it's actually not true. Um, in reality, we are more just than just our physical body. Um, the aura of our body is in magnetosphere, the same as the Earth. And we have many field interactions and many ways that we actually um, receive fields. And so we're going to just discuss a few ways that we do receive fields. Because only 20% of the field interactions are derived from our food in a, in a digestive system. Um, and so this is, this is the part that we um, have always been told that we're getting all our energy from, but we're also deriving it from many other places too. So our understanding from plasma has taught us that the food becomes plasma once entering the body. Nanoparticles are created and then ganced. Um, acid, alkaline, and salt all create the ganses. And then the field strengths of these ganses pass through the nano layers of the digestive tract. And then the lymph system carries the fields to the aerial organ where they're needed. And that's the basic teaching in the health teachings with the plasma. So now we get on to where else we absorb our fields from. Um, our lungs, there's a transfer of fields only. Um, and our lungs, feed our body through oxygen, nitrogen, and other fields in our blood, which is directly tied to our emotion. So the lungs feed our emotion only. Then our skin is also a transfer of fields only. And the skin is also, it has three layers. The white fat part um, has CO2, which allows the field transfer. The outer layer is the nano layer. And amino acids build up on the skin, which are oils, and show that the fields are absorbed by the skin, the same as in the CO2 box. And then we also get transfer of fields through our eyes. And energy is absorbed by the sight of man in nature. The green and colorful environment means that we um, very little energy is required to convert and use these fields. And in here, we have an amino acid connection with the plants, um, as well as our eyes are also an emotional connection. And what we see, if what we see pleases us and makes us happy, um, that is feeding our emotion. Um, hearing is also a transfer of fields only. Um, and most of the fields of smell, sound, and, and sight and taste of feeding our soul in a direct way. Uh, music and vibration touch our emotion and our soul, and our culture creates the attachment to certain sounds, rhythms, and vibrations. I've understood over time that, um, yes, each, each people in different cultures um, connect emotions to sounds differently. And then smell and taste, is a transfer of fields only as well. 
and the smell is directly received by the center of the brain and is in the emotion and soul of fed. And so here is a, a sort of a total outlook on how all the fields feed our bodies. And so 80% of them come from other sources beside our digestive system. And so 80% of fields absorbed by the body come from other than the digestive system. These fields are all, all feed the emotion and not the physicality, and the emotion controls the physicality. So any questions on that? Good morning, Lisa. Hello, who's Dimitri. speaking? Dimitri. Hello, Dimitri. Um, if only 20% of the fields are absorbed by the digestive system, um, you know, how, how important is solid food to us? I mean, are the fields that we absorb from the foods the uh, are they more essential than the other 80% that we absorb from the rest of our body? I mean, is, is it an, is it an absolute? Actually, yeah, I, I understand your question, but it's, it's, it's all subjective, I think, because the stronger your emotion is in control of your body, the more you can... Um, control what you absorb from outside and so at the moment with us being such physical beings we need the food and we also have this this hunger that needs to be satisfied but if we can start understanding and controlling our emotions um, that's the key to learning to start feeding from the fields um, because, you know, as soon as you come out the womb, you attach um, the love of your, your mother with the feeding. And so it's a, it's a very strong attachment. And so that's, that's how we'll have to get, um, we'd, we'll have to start taking the emotion out of the food that we eat, in a sense, and understanding that it's, it's not really necessary. And then we'll start being able to to do without it. Um, at first, I think you'd have to use the plasmas and that's why some of the guys can just literally drink the plasma water and they're quite happy with that. Um, but it's all to do with your, your emotion and how you feel about that. Um, I don't know what you think. Yeah, um, my, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in the process of nano coating uh, plates, etc. Um, I haven't uh, made any GANs, so I, I don't have any liquid plasma. Um, my since I began nano coating, my personal practices, spiritual practices have uh, um, really sorry, my cat's coming in, have have really um, increased dramatically, and my appetite has become very very small maybe even less than one tenth of what I used to eat um, I can eat more you know I can eat more but I'm, I, I'm I've decided to only eat if I'm if I'm really really hungry you know if I'm just hungry um, it doesn't seem like I'm eating out of a necessity um, it's just it's it's habitual you know and uh what's also i found really interesting is that i i used to smoke tobacco and um it wasn't until <clears throat> i began my my personal spiritual practices that I, i've been trying to quit smoking tobacco for a long time and it's the one thing uh to me uh, smoking tobacco was was more addictive than eating food <laughs> you know and since I've begun my practices uh, this week I haven't smoked a single thing now when I have tried to quit and have quit for some time in the past my appetite has gone through the roof and I have literally turned into uh, a horse or a, uh, you know a herd of cows and I can just eat the kitchen empty in a day 
but uh, I'm, I, I, I don't have that now. You know, I do not have that now. And even though I'm not smoking, my appetite hasn't gone through the roof. And I'm under the impression that that's simply because um, I am balancing myself emotionally and reconnecting with uh, the true me. And as a result of that, I'm, I'm literally feeding uh, off of external fields that come from everything other than solid food. Well, yes, um, we definitely, since we started our plasma journey, we eat, I would say, maybe a third of what we used to eat. Um, I still have to cook, and I, I don't, I'm not quite going off food yet because I've got to cook for my kids. And they're not quite on the same path that we are at this point. So um, I have to make sure that they're fed. And so we eat, but we eat very small amounts. And we don't have the same enjoyment in food like we used to. Um, I don't feel the need to, oh, I must cook this dish. You know, um, food also has emotional attachments involved in it. Um, and I just don't feel that same connection and, and having to eat certain dishes or anything anymore. So, yes, I think once once you start that understanding and you start um, getting more emotionally satisfied, you don't need the food as much. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to carry on now a little bit with the plants. And... Um, the plants are also reactors, and they have magnetical and gravitational fields. Um, when plants interact with the fields, they are not absorbing any matter state from the soils or the environment, and they are the ones that feed from the fields only. They understand how to do this. So everything interacts with everything else. And they're using the totality of themselves to absorb the fields. And this is why we've since understood working with the plasma that the plant, as it grows through its life, takes more and more fields from the atmosphere and from above and absorbs the, the amino acids through its leaves. And the root structure is there to um, hold it into the soil and also capture any fields that are around and in the soil that may help it to live with things such as nitrogen or minerals um, or water. So in summary, both the animal and the plant world interact with the fields in, in their environment. We're all reactors and we receive and we give fields all the time. We can view ourselves and the plants as little suns giving and receiving fields. So we need to explore the connection between the animal world and the plant world. We do have a physical connection because all living things on this planet are connected through the amino acid strengths as we all made from the same building blocks, which are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, CHO and N. And so because we all have these, we're constantly interacting with each other on, um, on that basis as living beings. Um, the, web on this, uh, uh, the web of life on this planet will be found to connect on many levels, from the smallest bacteria, which is amino acid based, to the most complex creatures, mammals and more, the more we still probably haven't discovered yet. We all share the amino acid connection. And so in order to understand this connection between ourselves and the plants, we need to look at the human body and its field strengths. Okay, so in man, we've understood with the plasma that the blood is, has a central core of iron, which had a, has a field strength of 55. Um, when we understand the field strength of our physicality, we use the copper, which has a field strength of 63. These field strengths all come from the atomic mass. 
Um, and when we understand our emotion, we've been taught that the emotion is the field strength of zinc, which is 65. Now, here comes the next part, which is you add up the field strength of the emotion and the physicality and the field strength of the soul of the human being, which is the neutron part, is iodine, which has a field strength of 129. Um, so that is how the human body works. And those are the, the fields we've been understanding for a while now. And um, we've been using the zinc and the CO2 um, and the copper and the iron to work on ourselves. So when we look at the plant world with the same understanding, we have to start building from another base. When we look at plants, their blood is actually the chlorophyll. And that is the field strength of 24, which is magnesium, which is the center core of the amino acid of the blood. So these are now the steps we took to find out um, where the plants fitted in. And we took our periodic table and we looked carefully at things. And there had to be correlation. And um, we had understood from biodynamics that silicon was very important. So we attributed the physicality um, with a field strength of 28 um, to the plant, which Mr. Kesh confirmed was correct. We then went and discovered that sulfur is the field strength of 32, which becomes the emotion of the plant. Because when you look at the plant, um, these the, the plant is made up of soft minerals, really. They don't have any of the, many of the heavier, harder elements. So we had to look lower down on the periodic table. And when we understood that these were the field strengths of the emotion and the physicality, what we understood from this is that the isotopes do play a role here, but the field strength of the soul of the plant is zinc. And this for me was a great revelation because I always understood that we had a great emotional bond with the plants. And so we realized from this, we actually have a connection with the plant's soul on our emotional level. And this is why plants are so important to us and give us so much of what we need in our emotional state. So when we look at man and plants, we can see that there is an amino acid connection, which we discussed earlier on, just like everything else on this planet. But so too is there a connection between the emotion of man and the soul of the plant. And we thought nature was something to use and abuse, but actually, it's something very much different. And we have a very, very special connection with the plants. We can now see that our emotional strength has a similar bandwidth to the soul strength of the plant. And this means that the plants give from their souls to feed our emotion. And these wonderful creations give without reservation to elevate us. So how's that, guys? <laughs> Um, were you expecting that? <laughs> so, the field interaction of man and plants is we take in fields through our sight, sound, smell, taste and fields. And all of these feed our emotions directly. And we absorb and give amino acid fields. And we give and take fields with our emotion. We also give and take fields with our soul. And the plants feed us in all of these ways. They feed our emotion with their soul. And this is why they give us so strongly and so freely. Um, 
so we can now have another look at nature with a totally different eye. And uh, Jimmy just loves this monkey. So he loves to put it in all the pictures <laughs> because the little guy's eyes go in and out. <laughs> and I think it's just so cute too. And yes, I think we have to take and look at things with a great deal of wonder now and um, start looking at plants in a much deeper way. They are much more evolved givers from their souls. Um, they take fields from their, plants take fields from their environment. They don't consume matter at all and therefore do not kill any other creations. Um, plants understand their role in the environment and um, they allow others to consume their leaves as they complete their cycle of life or provide pollen for bees so they might create offspring and share with others. They understand that they give unconditionally to others and by doing so can elevate themselves. And have some plants created themselves to be specifically used by man for healing? Um, as we've cried out for remedy and they've heard us. Because why is it on every continent on this planet there are healing herbs that are similar in their uses? Um, each plant has different zinc isotopes and these may be why certain animals choose to eat certain foods, not only for their minerals but the way the food brings contentment to the animal. Um, we understand for example that you know horses like different grasses to cows and which eat diff prefer different grasses to sheep. Um, maybe all of these different grasses have slightly different zinc isotopes and so that gives them what they need because each and each animal seems to need different zinc isotopes for their emotional needs as well. And we can also see how interaction with certain environments makes us feel. Um, are the trees or the shrubs or the grasses that are making us feel a certain way? I know we all feel totally different in a forest to what we feel in a big open meadow. Um, so maybe all of these things are showing us the way on how um, each field is slightly different. And so my own personal feelings as a gardener are that when we grow, nourish and care for our plants and we love our plants and touch their souls, they in turn give from their souls to make us feel happy in return. And some of my best feelings of connectedness with all around me and contentment in the world have been moments in my garden or out in nature and now I understand why. So, questions and discussions. Has anybody got any questions? That last paragraph where you um, had felt more connectedness when you were out in nature, um, I, I really, really understand that. Um, when I go for walks, I've not been doing as many walks because uh, um, it's a little bit cooler where I am and um, um, uh, in the private teaching so I don't have a, a, a lot of time to spare now um, but when I was uh, uh, walking a lot um, quite a few times I was uh, literally just overwhelmed with emotion and um, and it was uncontrollable you know just Floods of tears, not 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 in a bad way though, you know, and it it really did feel like uh, it was like a eureka moment, you know, like a realization, and um, and that's and that's because I was outside, you know, I was in the hills, I was walking around the mountains. There's not a a, a great deal of uh, um, 
of, of, of like high level plants, so to speak. It's all kind of low level shrubbery because um, it's, 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 it's quite dry around here and it's very mountainous. Um, Where are you? I'm in the south of Spain. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, all these experiences kind of, they just all compiled up, these realizations all compiled up. And um, especially after listening to uh, all of your teachings, you know, those realizations have, have really uh, evolved into a revelation, you know, those times when I was walking around and was just flooded with emotion. Uh, you know, it could well be uh, due to due to the plants around me because I had good, you know, I have good intention. I always have. And, you know, when when I when I walk around, I really do appreciate my surroundings. I always have. I'm 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 very very fortunate. I, where I grew up in England, um, I, I grew up on uh, s small holdings and small working farms, etc. So I've always been surrounded by nature. And um, as a child, I uh, because we lived in the sticks. I, I didn't have, I didn't really have any friends. It was just me and, and nature. I used to spend all day just running around the fields, etc. So I've, I've always been surrounded by by plants, um, and uh, you know I've always respect I've always respected nature. I've always loved nature for for everything that it has to offer. I really, really have loved it, and obviously still do. Um, and I think. You know, the, the the more I the more I look at my past, because now with this with this technology, with the guest teachings, etc., um, you know, it, it really has opened up. Uh, you know, like the book in of of my life, and I can, the more I learn about this technology, and the the reality of our existence. And you know the the truth of of what is going on, and what is going to go on. Uh, it the more I look back on my past, I just understand it so much more, you know. Yes. And uh, when when especially since I've been in the south of Spain, when walking around uh, and having these these these, these moments. Um, it's you know it's it's nature giving it's nature giving back to me <clears throat> um, do you find you have a slightly different feeling to the for the nature there which i understand is very mediterranean you know rocky mm. and um different shrubs and such compared to um grassy green um english countryside yeah. it has a different feel to it doesn't it Yes, it does. It does very much so. And every time I listen to your teachings, it makes me think of England and how much more luscious it is. Um, I've spent years walking around in the woods there and literally just falling asleep at the base of a tree, etc. I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and it's not possible to do that here. You know, I would, I would so, I would, I would. I really wish to be back in a in a much much more luscious green environment where the plants just flourish, but at that same time, there's not enough sunshine there for me. Um, I worship the sun for obvious reasons, and uh, it's too cloudy in England. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's it'll hard. take you. It'll take you a long while. Um, you know, with us coming out from South Africa to Australia. Um, I felt very alien here um, because in South Africa, I was very attached to my outdoors. And it was, is also a very different environment to the Australian outdoors. And um, it's taken me a good, I would say, five years to start feeling at home in a different, because it's different energy than what you're used yes. to. 
and you have to almost acclimatize to it and start seeing the beauty in stuff that um, isn't quite what you're used to. Um, and you start appreciating it, appreciating it eventually because I think you just start acclimatizing to the fields. But yes, I still miss the flat top trees of Africa and the different, yeah. there's a different smell to the soil. Um, yes. And all of those things are emotional fields that you connected to on a different, different level. Um, and and that's that's what I miss a lot is that smell of the rain. It's, it's even the rain smells different. Yeah, um, yeah. I have noticed that. Uh, I mean, I might be wrong, but there is the, the the soil's not great here in the south of Spain. It seems to be. Um, uh, it does not have enough carbon in it. You know, it, it, the soils just all look bleached. Um, they, they do way, way too much. Um, I can't think of the word at the moment. I've got a memory block. Tilling. Okay. They till everything. And there, 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 is, no, there is no ground cover at all. You know. And the, the, all, all the soils, they're just all, they're all bleached. You know. And that's uh, one reason why they, everywhere here, they are using... Uh, pharmaceutical strength fertilizers because they're, they're not putting the nutrients back into the soil and they won't allow the soil to be protected with low level ground cover if you just keep tilling the soil and you just have raw soil there because it's very windy around here all, all the topsoil just gets blown away and then there is literally nothing to feed the plants it is incredible how uh, I mean that's how I see it you know and to me, it's 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 not just incredible, but it's shocking that they don't they just don't see the common sense in that, you know. And they really, really do rely on on synthetics, um, which are not really harmonious with the plants. So, I think because there's such disconnection with nature that they don't feel how, you know, what if you if you sit back and listen and and, and observe. And understand then you, you then you start knowing what the plants need um, mm. and if you don't do that well then you just ride roughshod over nature which is what we've been doing for a few hundred years now yes mm. and it shows dramatically unfortunately times are changing though <laughs> yes hopefully anybody else got any other questions or yes uh, hello Lisa Hi. Uh, I've got a question. You haven't covered fruits, and uh, I guess you will be doing that later, perhaps. But uh, they're, they're a particular part of the plant that they give to us and to animals too, and they and they must carry a field strength in their own. Well, the fruits, the fruits are the, the, the fruits are the carriers of the seeds. And yes. so, you know, they, they've just evolved a way to spread their seeds in these. Um, Mr. Kesh has, has explained it, and we actually would like to do a program on it, is that the seed is actually a space, uh, the fruit is actually like a spaceship. Um, it's created its own little reactor or spaceship which carries its its occupants <laughs> to where they need to be for their next um, evolution and life so um, yes you know they they allow us to eat the seeds for example to spread well we should be spreading the seed um, if we eat the fruit um, but yes, mostly the seed is discarded because the the the, the fruit the seed part of the fruit is discarded because Mr. Kesh has explained that normally a seed is excessively bitter to us um, when we try to to chew it because in, we're eating the essence and the soul of the plant, and so it's actually um, off-putting to us. And so we have this reaction of this bitterness that um, we don't want to, to actually eat, to chew it. 
except for almonds and nuts, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> We've obviously grown accustomed to those. <laughs> well, what I ask the question is that um, in uh, India, for instance, uh, certain yogis only eat fruit and they don't eat the plant itself, which indicates they have, uh, they recognise the presence of a plant and the uh, harmony in nature I guess but they only eat fruit and the as a byproduct and uh, possibly uh, uh, well it gives all the nutrient uh, that is a uh, possibility that it, uh, it's a separate part of the plant the plant dispenses with it at a certain time so that the seeds can grow elsewhere and they also uh, actually uh, give uh, give the uh, fruit away as a, a matter of course to animals and us. Well, only in the hope that we spread their children far and wide. Um, you know, <laughs> we're not supposed to actually <laughs> eat oh, the seed and then they're gone. <laughs> We're supposed to to sort of like the like the animals. We're supposed to graze and and poop them out, and then they must grow somewhere else again. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Because seeds <laughs> go right through; they pass through your constitution. Yes. Thank you very so, much. Ed. Yeah, that's that is a point. But yeah, we're still eating their children, though, unfortunately. Anybody else? Uh, good morning, Lisa. Good this morning. Is, this is Alex. Hello, Alex. Uh, How are you doing? Uh, not, not too bad. Our lucky number today is four. It's four o'clock in the morning and it's minus 40 degrees outside. Oh, God, okay. <laughs> I hope you're cozily tucked up in a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're getting ready for spring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a I have a ton of ton of questions to ask you, but uh, you you've uh, you've made an astounding seminar today. I'm I'm really excited about this. Uh, can you please uh, um, elaborate on your statement? Bacteria is an amino acid based, or bacteria is amino acid based. So, uh, can you just elaborate on that a little bit, please? Well, the, your bacteria are the smallest. Um, the smallest amino acid that it, you can consider life on the planet, really. And so, in the, in later slides, we're going to be looking at how, you know, even they have connection with us, um, because they are good and bad bacteria, um, and they also have symbiosis with the plants, for example. No, so yes, they, I'm jumping ahead, actually. You, yeah, it is a little bit ahead, but not serious because, yeah, that's that's something we haven't quite hammered out all the ins and outs because the whole web of life, basically, if we look at this, we connect with our, emo our emotion to the soil of the plant and maybe the plant connects with its emotion to the soil of the bacteria, for example, and maybe, you know, there's there's a link in between with the... Um, the fish, which are the white meat animals, and somewhere there's, a, you know, so each of them has their sort of stepping, their stair step approach in the periodic table to how we can look at the field strengths of their physicality, emotion, and soul. Um, and we'll figure out that there's a, you know, there's a web connecting everything. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, just looking at the, uh, uh, numbers, the uh, atomic weights. And I'll go back there for you. I'm oh, sorry. Um, and you can actually, I said I'm going to go back there for you on the slides. Um, quite a few slides so, back. Well, my question pertains. There we go. My question pertains to the fertilizer. That's an excellent, excellent slide. Uh, my uh, question, uh, okay, so the fertilizer industry, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, they must be enjoying this seminar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> NPK standard is uh, 7, 15, and 19. And uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how that relates to the numbers that you have there. Uh, at this point, I don't see a relationship. So what are we, uh, what are they doing and uh, what are we doing? That's the question. Um, I think what they are doing is they are adding, because we understand that by adding the nitrogen, the, um, the, the phosphorus and the potassium, they all, they all are sort of building blocks in the GANS form that the plants can use. So they will be used by the plant because they're there and the plants will use whatever fields they can take up that they can transform into what they need. But the point is, is that they're just feeding the physical because they're just understanding, okay, if I put this on, the plant will go green and it'll grow. Um, yeah, but these fertilizers are not in a GAN state. They're in a physical state, are they not? Yes, they are. Until they do get mixed with water, they can become oxides and um, get used. And Jimmy's, Jimmy's poking me here and tells me he wants to talk, so I'm going to shift over and let him talk. <laughs> Hi, Jim. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Um, it's something that we've been trying to work on as well, and... Obviously, we understand that from nitrogen, why nitrogen is so important is because the nitrogen fertilizer doesn't work until it's mixed with water. So you can throw fertilizer in your soil and nitrogen and it won't work until it rains. Okay, so or water, um, or water. So when it's mixed with the water, it then becomes in, in that plasma state. And we have understood that from nitrogen, the plants can take up the fields of the nitrogen and then they use that nitrogen to create carbon and oxygen. And when the nitrogen goes to the carbon, additional energy is given off. So there's that connection there with the nitrogen. When I look at the phosphorus as to why the fertilizer industries used phosphorus, when you look on the periodic table, phosphorus sits slap bang in the middle between silicon and sulfur. So my thinking is that what, is, what the plants are doing is they are able to take that phosphorus and bear in mind it's in, they take up the fields and internally it's in a GAN state. They can turn that phosphorus into either silicon or sulfur when you look on the periodic table because it's just a matter of adding uh, a bit of hydrogen or taking away a bit of... Uh, uh, hydrogen and you're getting your silicon and sulfur. So that's where the, my thinking the phosphorus fits in. And oh, uh, uh, you, you've doubled the numbers on the, uh, on the chart. That's, that's the thing. Okay. I, I'm, so the, well, I look at, yeah, the MPK yeah. standard is, so it actually is 1430 and 38. That's, that's well, those uh, numbers just tell you how, what their mixture is in, in ratio of, of, uh, nitrogen and potassium. So that doesn't; those numbers don't pertain to these. These are the atomic mass numbers. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Also, the NPK, the, the atomic mass numbers, tend to okay. to reflect with this chart. Okay, now I'm getting it. So, so the um, phosphorus is in between the silicon and the sulfur. Yeah. Yeah. At thirty. That's right. Because if you look at um, sulfur, for example, at thirty-two, so it has. Um, six neutrons and six protons. When one looks at phosphorus, it's 16 neutrons and 15 protons. So by taking that phosphorus and the plants will add a bit of hydrogen energy to that, they can turn their phosphorus into sulfur and either way around. Um, and this is what we're beginning to understand on how the plants do their uh, sort of transmutation internally. Okay, I'm, I'm going to let you carry on with the potassium before I ask the next question. Potassium, um, I'm looking at that as well, and it's very, very close to calcium, um, which is quite predominant in the soils. So the plants would also be able to take a lot of the calcium and turn it into potassium. 
Um, and the potassium as well is, from Salt. what we've understood, is also quite uh, radioactive in a sense that it gives off a lot of energy. So it can be, um, it's used by the plants and they'll turn potassium into something else and then use that energy for as hydrogens for the growth. So this is still uh, something we're trying to understand because it, it, it changes the whole way of um, the way the plants grow and the photosynthesis and um, we're still trying to get a handle on all of that. <laughs> in, in, indeed, and then uh, you succeeded in opening up another can of worms Yes. Uh, calcium, uh, generally speaking, is insoluble. So there has to be some kind of way, are we assuming some kind of way to make it soluble uh, so that the plants can uptake it? Just, just bear in mind, when it's calcium is, is sort of in the soils, the plants are only taking up the fields. They are not taking up any physical calcium. Okay. Okay. Um, so everything within the plant is then done in a in a Gantz in a plasma state. So nothing's in a matter state. Okay. So so the uh, solubility is not a factor, is what you're saying. Well, as I say, I, I'm I'm trying to understand here, and and uh, it, it's still a bit hard for me to to get to the nitty gritty of it. So the phosphorus one I do understand quite a bit, but the calcium one I'm still trying to get my head around. So. We'll leave it at that, I think, before I'm, uh, I say things that <laughs> are probably incorrect. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Here. No, it's, 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 we all learn it, you know, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. We, we're all quite happy to say we just don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an excellent answer also. The yeah. interesting thing with this chart here is that when you're introducing the silicone and the magnesium, I mean, those are the two basic uh, components of the Earth's crust. And uh, uh, yeah. so, so this, this is a totally different uh, revelation. Uh, now, last week uh, we were talking and uh, uh, I, I said the plants have a calling. Uh, and uh, I think you, you've uh, answered that question now because if the plants have an emotion, and, uh, and they do, and uh, the Gaia or the Earth itself has an emotion, and if we have uh, excessive pollution, which is, let's say, in, um, in, in some cases, like I used the example last week, uh, over acidification of the soil. Mm. So, so what we're looking for is uh, some kind of alkaline offsetting. And, and so the, the dandelion is called because the dandelion brings the, uh, well, it brings the calcium. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So uh, the emotion of the dandelion must somehow communicate with the emotion of the earth. The way I understand it and one can look at it is all the souls of all the plants, all the animals, all the insects, all these, all our souls all connect to form and add to the soul of the earth. understand that exactly yes so, so we all connected um, in, in every which way you know so our combined souls um, of, of all the plants and, and all the animals contribute to the soul of the planet so. well what I'm uh, going for here is that all plants have a different uh, uh, elemental uh, component or, or uh, an, an elemental affinity. So, so uh, some plants would have uh, more iron, some plants would have more zinc, or some plants would have more calcium. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the reason that they have that is because that is their function, is, is to heal the planet. Uh, yes. That, that's how I see it. Yeah, I, we see it the same, you know, they all are totally um, different to each other and they all have their purpose. They all, you know, almost like nature calls them to come and sort out um, a problem. Exactly. And they come and serve, you know, and they serve the planet and they serve us as people as exactly. well. Exactly. So, so now, now we go to the statement where, where you said, you know, the, 
the soil, the whole purpose of the soil is basically to anchor the plant or, or whatever. And, and um, as uh, Dimitri mentioned, you know, about tillage and, and uh, uh, just, just the soil maintenance and, and topsoil, questions about topsoil erosion and all of that, this is all soil based. And, and yet uh, you, you've totally discounted the impact of the soil and, and rendered it kind of a useless component coming right down to the point where it's just anchoring the plant. And uh, so, so, well, there, there has to be, uh, if I may just finish, the, yeah. the, uh, when we apply the fertilizer to, to the, uh, or um, shall we say the, the older technology, when we apply the fertilizer, we don't take into account the fields. We just kind of spread it out and God bless. You know, we don't really know what we're doing in that regard. But clearly there is a, a, a field strength in the roots and that, uh, that um, in your diagram you had a little bit earlier before this uh, plate here, uh, it shows the different field strengths uh, around the roots. And, and so they must be inter interacting with the minerals that are in the soil. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, on, on many occasions when we've listened to um, the workshops that Mr. Kish has given, on, on many occasions he's stated that um, that the roots become are insignificant and, and the plants are taking all of the, most of their fields through their, their root, their leaf structure. And uh, I, I'm, I'm on the same page as you and I'm sure a lot of people is I've, I've battled to understand that because um, I also feel that the, the soils being connected to the earth is giving different energies that the plants need. And um, yeah, so it's something that we haven't come across in any of his teachings yet on, on the soil and, and its impact on the soil biology. Um, but I just instinctively know that it is just as important as the top. So, um, Oh, you know, oh we, for sure, for sure. Mm. And, and why I'm uh, going in this direction is because we, we do have plants that are actually attached not to the soil, but to the rocks. Yes. And, and of course, you're doing hydroponics, which I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, totally impressed with. The, uh, uh, so if we look at the rocks, for instance, and that is a very heavy matter state, and, and 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 so there's a high mineral content in, in that as opposed to humus. Um, uh, um, what do you call it? A, a peat, as, yes. as opposed to a peat or a topsoil. So so uh, the plant must be getting its energy, must be getting its minerals from that rock via a gans or a plasmic uh, mm. a reaction. So yeah, I mean we see it. We see it every day in, in, in our aquaponics is, you know, if we don't have anything in the water, the plants won't grow, they'll die. So, you know, that's why I, I find it difficult to understand where it's coming from. Maybe in the future, when we start looking at uh, creating reactors and spinning reactors, we will be able to give the plants uh, enough food from the air so that they don't need to take from the root systems, you know, so this is all, it's all there that we can start discussing and, and uh, looking at and uh, trying to understand. Well, so. If I may, if I may just offer uh, something on that, uh, I, I, from, from, from my own experience that uh, the root is, is absolutely essential because it yeah. is, uh, w without the root, the plants can't grow. And, and, you know, you know, for instance, here, uh, I'm in Canada, we import a lot of plants here, and then basically they, they force us to cut off the roots before they bring them in. And, and, and so it's very difficult to get the plants to grow uh, without the roots. So, so yeah. there's a tremendous amount of, it is more than just anchorage, there is a tremendous amount of field strength that's built up in the roots and then it uh, passes on through the leaves. And then the, the leaves, because of the high concentration of chlorophyll, are able to absorb the sunlight and, and then uh, with through um, a photosynthesis that they have the proper cell respiration off the leaves. And then the plant really takes off. 
So, so all, all of that is, is uh, uh, working quite well together. My, my earlier point with respect to the calling of the plants, if a, person, if a specific plant has a, a specific uh, metallic or a, a elemental affinity, then, you know, from a hydroponic standpoint, that element needs to be fed into the hydroponic system to match the plant that you're trying to grow. Um, and yes, uh, and that's why we've found that using the uh, the seawater or the ocean GANS is terrific because there is just about everything in there. So whatever they need, they take. Brilliant. So we can grow, yeah. for example, we can grow cucumbers, tomatoes, lettuces, and also you know Egg in plants. the eggplants in the same water, whereas hydroponic guys can't do that. Right. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. So so you. And, and that uh, fits in with the um, plasma uh, philosophy where take what you need and no more and no less. That's it, yes. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll let you carry <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got far to go. <laughs> I've just got to get there now with the... Flick, 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 <laughs> and we can look out. Look at the little monkey again. I love the little monkey. Where's he? No, he's not coming yet. <laughs> there he is <laughs> with his little eyes. Um, okay, here we go. So the next part of the discussion is what can we give to the plants? Because now we've just figured out they're giving so much to us. And so, many studies showing plants responses to people's emotions have been done over the years. And I'm sure a lot of you guys might have heard of them and seen them. So I haven't listed them all here, but studies have shown responses of plants to man's emotion from hooking up plants to sound equipment, to lie detectors and field trials where plots of land are given love or hate. All of these studies show correlations, but couldn't tell us why. Uh, now we see why we can use our knowledge to nurture our vertical brothers on the planet. And we can start to explore ways to give health and vitality to the plants, not only through application of plasma, but by giving our loving emotion and gratitude to them as well. And we can help feed the souls of the plants as much as they feed our emotion. I reckon if we stand in the middle of our farm and send out love to our plants that we grow, they'll absorb just as much and have just as much as if we're spinning a CO2 reactor. Um, and so we need to give ourselves green thumbs by establishing an emotional connection with our plants. They in turn will start connecting with you on a deeper level and you'll find out that you can see to their needs more fully as they will tell you if you ask what they need. And feeling is the key process here. So be open to the soft voice that may only speak into your, to your intuition. And the more we acknowledge the connection and nurture it, the stronger it will become. Um, I was highly attuned to my garden back home. It was a beautiful garden that I didn't grow much food in, but I grew it for beauty. And I would walk through my garden every day and I'd touch and stroke plants as I walked past them. And they gave me such joy. Um, now, because we have to grow plants and actually harvest them, and it's more like a factory setup, I don't have the same connection with my plants. And this actually upsets me um, because you almost have to not have that connection because you, you're using them and um, not just letting them be. So I think we need to start connecting with them and understanding them and... Um, nurturing special relationship and then hopefully 
In time, our connection and understanding will bring us to a point of such nurture and love, we'll ultimately become restorers of the environment and have no need to use these creations as our food. And meanwhile, we can hopefully grow crops that in their abundance and strength will allow us to grow less, feed our people with healthier food, and ultimately create a better world. And through our plants, we'll begin to communicate with the rest of creations on this planet and beyond. Because if we can't talk to our plants, I don't know how anyone expects us to go into space and, and connect with any other creatures. So, also, the point of the teaching was, don't forget to feed your plants with the zinc gans water as well as the CO2 for connection to the amino acid, CH3 for energy, and if you can, some C GANS for the mineral needs of your plant. So those are the, the takeaways that we can start using with our plasmas, is to add the zinc GANS to the water and see what that is going to, to do. So, as we got asked earlier about the bacteria, when we start looking at the connections, there are going to be things like fungi, bacteria and insects, which will have to start understanding their emotion, physicality and the fluid that flows through their bodies and what their soul connection with us or the planet is. I don't know about the insects mostly, besides the bees, I'm not too keen on many of them. Um, and who's to say what's above us on the other side of the spectrum, which we sometimes don't like to discuss and what may be feeding on us, which is um, another subject entirely, which can be pretty uncomfortable, I think. And, um, so the web of, this life, of life on this planet, again, will be found, found to connect on many levels. From the smallest bacteria, which is an amino acid, to the most complex creature, mammals and more, we all share the amino acid connection. So, there's the bacteria. Any questions and discussions and feedback on that? <laughs> Uh, Lisa, that's me again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I had no idea, the, and, and I'm glad you answered that question. That, that's a beautiful answer there. Uh, one experiment that I did, uh, you're, you're familiar with uh, diatomaceous powder, diatomaceous earth? Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, among other things, uh, we, we use it for eliminating parasites in, in the bowel. And, uh, and basically we just mix it in a, in a, a smoothie and, and down the hatch and, and uh, you're passing worms, you know, within, within days. So and it, it works extremely effectively. And, Sorry, uh, could I just interrupt you? Could you just tell me what that was again, please? It's a diatom powder. Could you, sorry, can you spell that? D-I-A-T-O-M. Yes, the, the other um, name for it is diatomaceous earth. It's made up of little tiny um, uh, fossilized sea creatures that, you know, very di diatomic, meaning very tiny little, like two-atomed sea creatures. It's almost like calcified and it's very fine um, so what we use it for as well is um, we've used it to spray on and it literally dries up things like aphids um, mm. if, if you if you mix it up in a, a liquid form and you spray it onto your crops it will kill uh, larva and eggs of of, um, of caterpillars and it will sort of um, uh, stop the the little aphids that they like goo up all their joints and then they can't move anymore and they die. So um, it's used quite yeah. extensively in agriculture and it's also you know got a lot of calcium in it. Okay, thank you. The, yes, um, the basic component is uh, silicon oxide, uh, SiO2, silicon dioxide. 
But um, the interesting uh, point uh, is, is that when you ingest it, well, actually, when you apply it to uh, cockroaches, let's say, uh, they, they will suffocate. And when you uh, apply it to worms in the intestinal tract, uh, they, they, they too will suffocate or and then the, the, they'll want to leave the system very quickly. Interestingly enough, is that we, uh, if we have parasites within our cells, it, it would also affect them. And, and so one of the questions that I was always wondering is, is how does this diatomaceous powder, which is in a powder form, work its way into the cellular structure of our body? And so obviously it, it doesn't. We obviously create a GANS and then the plasma field actually goes in there. And interestingly enough, the, the plasma field of the diatomaceous earth acts the same way. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Yes. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, these silicons and sulfurs and, um, do actually work as um, moving those creatures on to another plane. <laughs> So whether they are working on the emotion or the soul or the which bits, <laughs> because um, I think we're going to find they're all going to fit into this periodic table somewhat in some fashion or another. Um, so yes, and, and that's why we need to start understanding because I reckon what the soil, the reason we're needing good soils is because the living creatures then in the soil are then ganses and plasmas and so they are feeding the energies to the roots of the plants whereas a dead soil doesn't have any other energies except maybe whatever fertilizer you've managed to throw on there and solubize in water yes Um, you know, we we discovered, we did some testing with our strawberries at one point. We did them, we just created some Dutch buckets to, um, to for hydroponic strawberries. And we just um, had plasma in there. And um, we first filled it up with some of our aquaponic water, which had bacteria in, um, you know, the nitrifying bacteria. And so those strawberries grew for a very long time um, but then when the nitrifying bacteria eventually died that is when they couldn't sustain themselves so they were using those bacteria not for the nitrogen because there was no nitrogen in that water but they were using the bacteria um, for fields um, and that plasma in the water was not enough to sustain the plants on their own. They survived and they lived, but they didn't thrive. Um, so we have to kind of, that, that's what, you know, in a way that taught us that the, the um, roots, they weren't absorbing all they needed from the roots. They were in a greenhouse as well. So they were not getting any amino acid fields from above. And that's when we realized we do have to start creating the spinning balls or because, you know, what we discovered as well is that most greenhouse uh, growers water their plants from above, like a mist sprayer or something. So the ganses are then forming on the leaves and the, the plants can absorb off their leaves. Whereas if you just dangle something with roots in the water, it, um, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, all these little trials and tests that we've done have, have sort of taken us on a path. We haven't quite got there yet, but we, we're slowly understanding. The, the one thing I do know about uh, the silicone also and, uh, is, is that it really helps strengthen the uh, skin. And uh, uh, it helps with the collagen buildup in, in the skin. And so when you put this diagram up and you introduce silicone and magnesium to the plant, I mean, that, that was one of the startling things for me because, because of this, what I was doing with the diatomaceous earth uh, kind of thing. So um, 
the uh, other thing that I know about the silicone is uh, I, I have concrete experience, and, and when I was uh, pouring concrete and uh, working with it in, in its fresh state, it seemed to attract ants. And this is a question that I have because I, I know that ants don't eat food, they eat fungi. And so this, this is a question for a, a future uh, seminar. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing that struck me when you said that was that ants hate acidity. So maybe they're drawn to a, a higher pH because the uh, oh, concrete and and cement is a, has a higher pH. Uh, yes, it's plus 10. Yeah. And, and the fungus is uh, 3. Isn't, <laughs> isn't that interesting? <laughs> Because I know with our systems, they told us we should take, um, what is it, citric, citric acid, acid um, and sort of seed, uh, sort of salt the earth underneath our systems with citric acid so that the, the ants wouldn't build their nests there because they don't like the acidity. Uh, oh, oh, yes, okay. I see. Yeah. You know, because we have these troughs sitting on the on the top of the ground, so those big long troughs, and and they are out of marine plywood. So if the ants get in, they they chew up things and they they chew up plastic and create leaks and all sorts. So, um, yes, and they um, also like to farm the aphids on our lettuces when the lettuces weren't growing so happily. They were they were farming lots of aphids on our lettuce. That that is true, but it's it's the fungus that is attracting it all. So, so if if a plant is dying, it is it is uh, decaying, and then the fungus starts to grow. So, there there you have the attraction. So, a healthy plant will will not attract the uh, the ants. They they do a really good job. They they leave if 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 your property is healthy, they're gone. So, uh, uh, this is where the diatomaceous earth also comes in because. Uh, in our case, we have an extremely acidic soil. We're talking around 4.5 4, 4 on the pH scale. So uh, by, by putting the diatomaceous earth in there, it raises it uh, dramatically, and, uh, and, and so, so we, we eliminate the end problem that way. <coughs> yeah, strangely enough, you know, we've just, we've got ants literally that they live under um, almost a whole acre um, they just the, the nest is everywhere, from our property to the neighbours to under the road probably to the neighbour over the road. So they're just all over the, the place um, because the soils here in Australia are not great, and um, so they just get in everywhere. And there are so many different types of ants as well, many different varieties, many which bite like the blazers. You can't believe how they, these giant bull ants that bite you very painfully. <laughs> So um, yeah, we've we've had our fair share of ant issues, but um, yeah, our, the DE we use a lot to just discourage them. Um, but we've tried copper gants in rings and things like that, and it hasn't done anything. You no, know, so if you can if you can figure out how to get rid of the, the fungus, that that's what attracts them. They they, they will leave, and they, they will leave like an army. It's just brilliant how they go. But uh, well, do you know what the pH of your soil is? No idea. Uh, no, because we don't grow in our soil. <laughs> no, but um, I mean that's what the, that's what attracts the ants if it, if it is a very low pH. I'll test it. And yes, we'll have a look and see. Yeah. Well, we have a huge acid rain problem over here. I I, I would imagine, I, I would guess that you'd have the same thing. Well, we do have many of those trails in the sky. That nobody likes to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> when are we going to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> we controversial enough as it is. <laughs> okay, I'm muting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we ne we never believed they were real. That in South Africa we never saw one, and then we came to Australia and realized there were all these crisscrosses in the sky, <laughs> and realized that it was true. Wow. Yeah. And and in and in South Africa we lived under a flight path. So don't tell me it's just coming from normal planes because it's not. No. When no. you were in South Africa, 
was there much vegetation, plant life around? Uh, Man-made, yes. Instance? You know, we yeah. were very suburban, but um, yeah. yes, there was a lot of lot of plant life around and uh, a lot of trees. Our Johannesburg region is considered the biggest man-made forest on the planet because of the, the trees that have been planted in that whole region. It's a huge area of Johannesburg and all the surrounding cities and suburbs. And it's all just trees. Okay. It's just I've, I've noticed um, I get a lot of these, uh, these, these we call them crisscrosses, um, in the sky where, uh, where I am. And... Um, it just seems uh, when 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 you get when I when I when I if I have to go to a city or something like that, I don't I don't see them. But as soon as I get out into nature, I see them. They're, they're, they're all over, and uh, it just it just it just makes me think that you know with with what they're uh, the, the nanoparticles that they are putting into the sky. Is it a uh, is is one of the reasons for it a direct attack on plant life? You know, there's so many things I don't know, but all I reckon is with Africa is they decided that we were doing a good job of destroying ourselves there. They didn't need to help us along, so <laughs> they just yeah. left it alone. They didn't have to spend the money. But uh, they there's been a concerted effort the whole eastern seaboard of Australia. And I think that it's to, almost to chase the farmers away. Yeah. You better come west, uh, Lisa, because we've got no um, chemtrails at all here. Eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> they, they spray them far inland here and then the, the wind takes them out and over the whole eastern side of Australia and then possibly off to New Zealand, I don't know because they go yeah. out over the ocean often yeah and they do it they they do it uh before the when the, the fronts the weather fronts come in so it kind of strengthens whatever front comes through mm. hello class i see you've joined us uh no. class is not listening to you Hello, I hear you. Yes, yes. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Hello together. Hello, class. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, today I'm a little tired. We have uh, yesterday a great workshop with nearly 20 people to train our perception in, uh, to detect, uh, to feel, and to learn more about the plasma fields and how they interact in uh, nature. That's very great. But, Wonderful. Uh, Today I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> and to handle much, much energy for all these different people and from the nature and from the fields, from the plasma. And so I'm today a little groggy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a lot out when you do those workshops. It gives you a lot of energy, though. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, nearly uh, two or three weeks, we have the, the first uh, workshop um, for um, agriculture with, uh, with different people from Austria and in Germany. And uh, I hope it's, I think it will be very good for the next station to, uh, yeah, for, for our uh, spring and summer season in, in uh, Northern, uh, Northern Europe and in Austria. Yes, yeah, good timing to get everybody uh, busy and uh, making the plasma for their gardens and their fields. Uh, we have uh, a very uh, interesting result from a friend of me, from Sonia, and uh, she sucks uh, seeds from Chile, and in four to six days they uh, become uh, uh, what is the world um, uh, not growing? What makes, this, makes the seeds in, in the first time when you when you suck in? It germinate. Yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, and normally, way, uh, Chile uh, have to germinate uh, two or three weeks. And they need only four to six days. Uh, six days. Okay. Yeah, very yeah, interesting. 
they generally do take the year up to about two weeks, eh? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, did she, did um, she soak them in the CO2? Uh, I don't really um, notice, uh, but I think the next time she come into the uh, growers and gardeners workshop, and then she can tell it. Yes, that'll be great. Yeah. Um, we we spun one of our new reactors today, Klaus, yeah. and all we had in there was a little bit of CO2 GANS water, okay. and I I used the pendulum to see how far it the fields went, mm -hmm. and it was about a radius of 25 meters, so it, it it would it would cover a good 50 meters. Yes, uh, which uh, RPM you uh, you turned this reactor? Oh, full speed. <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it hasn't got an RPM test thingy there to tell, but it, we put it right up to the top and they are, they are um, the high speed ones that are ordered. Yeah. Uh, I think we need not so much speed uh, uh, for the agriculture. I see uh, the little computer fans uh, are enough uh, and we can, we can slow them down to I see a RPM to 100 or 110, not, not much. Okay. All right, Well, You know, we were just trying one thing just to see, and it's, it's so much stronger than, than just, you know, and that was just the water and one core. So, yeah, yeah. We, we thought we'd do some different little bits of testings as we go along. And um, the whole point put... With little reactors and, and uh, slow speed, uh, we have in, in our garden we have so uh, seven or eight thousand square meter, and I think I, I need only three or four small reactors or different uh, cores to hang in, in the trees, not too too strong uh, the fields in the beginning. We have to, uh, from my side, I I feel that I go in this, into this slowly, slowly, step by step. Yeah. And we can well, yes. yeah. um, what we found is that it, it actually makes you feel strange. It's it feels the same almost as going into the the health unit. Yeah. Um and you feel almost uh like pressure and lightheadedness. Um so yes, it's it's it is pretty strong. Uh, we also play, and yesterday uh, I pointed pointed with with some uh, ganses uh, different uh, uh, ground power points from the house we we, we discuss, and uh, the people stay in these fields, and uh, they all have uh, the same feeling. Uh, we uh, I make a triangle, and uh, the energy for the people goes directly into the, uh, the feet, into the ground. Also they, were, they are very grounded. And on the other way, we can uh, play the same game to bring up the energy high. So we have uh, two triangles or two uh, um, star formation uh, uh, built that we can bring uh, the energy from the, from the ground to the top and the other side. And the same effect I see with, uh, sorry, I haven't uh, this time, my camera does uh, this time not work and uh, I have to buy a new computer. My, I have a hard, hardware problem. And then I can show you what I found out with the CO2 and uh, H2O, how they play uh, and interact. And so we can bring the energy in uh, from the ground to the top and the other side. I, I, I found a way. Okay. Um, is, it, is it the different um, arrangement of your ganses? Um, not only the ganses, is it is a, a, a field interaction between um, atmosphere and uh, the geomagnetic field okay. that I found. And uh, I'm, I think I'm the, on the right way, but I, I can show you this in, in 14 days. Uh, we, we fix it up the next days and then I can show this. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, please, we, we, 
are always hoping and waiting for you to come and show us. Yeah. <laughs> so next time you must. Yeah, I hope <laughs> the next time the camera. It's <laughs> 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 my different camera from outside, uh, and no camera will work. <laughs> <laughs> There's something in, I, I, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but there's no problem. Okay, the next section. Are there any more questions? One, Jimmy. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, when you say uh, Klaus is going to be giving a demo, uh, he you mean on this program? Yes, you can, yeah. That would be good. I was interested in that pendulum and yes. those uh, centres that he activates. Is it, yeah, well, is it we, possible he can do a uh, presentation on that? Class, are you up to that? Yes, um, we filmed the, the whole workshop, so we uh, have uh, yesterday a replay on the first workshop and mm. uh, I have a camera team uh, by and they filmed this and we have uh, to cut the film and then uh, we, we translated this to English and then we can uh, stop, uh, uh, start on, on this side, I can give you the, uh, by Dropbox, uh, can give you this film and we can okay. uh, work together, yes? Yes, yes, I think, I think we've got many people very interested, so it'll be yeah. good. But uh, I think we need the, uh, some weeks, it's, it's much work. Yes, that uh, is. <laughs> 20 hours and, and we, we bring it uh, two, uh, you know, two hours. So. Yeah, oh, when you're ready, let us know, that's fine. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. And yes, I, I have um, managed to get your translation going on the grape seed, so we, we must have a chat about that at some point. Um, yeah, uh, this is a, a whole book, and uh, I have it. Uh, this is a, a, a combination from uh, German and Spanish language. Maybe you have someone who speaks Spanish in your area. No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but... but um, who was there? Dimitri, could you speak Spanish? Unfortunately not, no. Okay. <laughs> well, some guy uh, who translated from German, yes? Yes, I've, I, I had my friend translate yeah. from German. She's living in Germany, so she, she managed to do the English of that, um, that table you sent. Yeah, so, um, maybe we can, we can make a, a Zoom together. Yes, I think so. And then you know if we can if we can have a chat on that one then and and sort it out then we can also show that next workshop in terms of yeah. just for people to understand some stuff about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the next ten to fourteen days I'm very busy. We uh, we start the the, the uh, Austrian manufacturing uh, and we built the uh, medical device and also the the breeding devices and they work very well. The breeding device is one of the best for me. Is that the, the sort of double coil? Uh, it's a cylinder, and in the cylinder is a, a, a small uh, glass vortex, like a, like a beer glass. And uh, we uh, draw the, the, uh, the pipe, the plastic pipe, these are seven or eight meters around this vortex. And uh, in this uh, cylinder is only CO2 sink cans. And okay. uh, with a little fish tank pump or a pump for, for inhaling, uh, you can uh, work and it's very, very good. Okay, yes, I think that, that would be quite effective because I've tried with my daughter with the, just a plain sort of a patch around a, a pipe um, with a bit of a, a, a piece from a nebulizer, but it didn't seem yeah. to be very effective. I don't think it was strong enough with the fields yeah, it's, um. it's strong enough. We have uh, also in, in inhaling pump. So it's, it's a small pump is uh, six volts and uh, it works very well. So today I was very tired and I, I breathed for 20 minutes and now I am still very uh, uh, energized. You need a bit of CH3 as well there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> you can play with this. 
uh, I give it a, a little aland, this is a plant for, for the lung. And also I think uh, Moringa guns will fit in this very well. Moringa have uh, different uh, vitamins and minerals and all the micro elements, it's very good. Okay, yes, and we can, we can get quite a lot of Moringa here. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've actually made a gans of Moringa and it, it ganced so easily and so quickly that I was quite surprised. And I think also it fits very well for the plants. Yes, a, a good, a good fertilizer almost. Yes, and uh, last week I became a message from uh, two Austrian guides. They, they find a, a special fertilizer from uh, uh, some minerals, and I have to research what, uh, how they uh, uh, built this. This was, was a great article in, in, in the newspaper. And uh, they are nearly to me, uh, 150 kilometers, and I will uh, look at the skies and, and discuss some things with this. Okay, okay well, that's good. Very good things today, uh, in, in, in the last time. <laughs> You've been busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but only the, the next two or three weeks, and then we, we have to start our garden season. <laughs> ah, yes. And then you'll be even more busy. Yeah, but at home. <laughs> are you still are you still busy uh, building the coil units for the for the health units, or are they on a different a new yes, design also, now? Also, and uh, there are um, from week to week there are more uh, doctors. They uh, will work with this. They see the results. There are great results. And also with the uh, direct injection trail, uh, very good results. Uh, okay, I think the next weeks will show some good, good stuff. Oh, that's great! Very encouraging. Yeah, and we just we just need a few tips. You must uh, have a yeah. chat to the other class there on this on this uh, uh, high blood pressure and diabetes story that Mr. Kesh is always talking about because I think if we can get that out to a lot of people, I think that's uh, a key. Yep. I think every second person that I know has high blood pressure or diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last, last weeks are um, many people gone. I was in, 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 uh, uh, and all, or the, the, the most of them, uh, 50 to 60 years. It's a very great problem at this time. And uh, we see uh, uh, very good results with this uh, new technique. Yes, I think, I think it can work very fast. Um, with, you know, it's, I think it is so, so emotional on so many levels. You can hear this burr. Yes. This is the breathing <laughs> device. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you can um, work with this one or two hours a day. Uh, and it, it works so well. Uh, well, uh, from the lung you feed the, all, all the emotions and, uh, to the blood and uh, to the lymph. is a very effective and an easy way. So, yes, instead of a whole big unit, it, it, it helps with a lot of things, I suppose. Yeah. I must, uh, I must build one of those, really. I think I'm, because I, I had bought a little nebulizer for my daughter as well. But yeah. when I put the Gans water in there, she says to me, no, it, it makes it, her feel like um, her, her asthma is worse, like she can't breathe properly, like she's sort of drowning. Mm -hmm. It's too wet. So I think the, the tube is a, with just plain air is a better solution. Yeah, uh, the, the length of the tube, uh, you, uh, then you can detect more fields. Uh, I, I measure this from, from, from the standpoint of my perception and I see uh, the, the tube uh, must be uh, seven, seven and a half meter, eight meters. So in this. Okay, so you've got to just compactly wind it into the... Yeah into the cylinder, the cylinder. And then you does it need a double double um layer uh, no the tube is is the air so you uh, put the gans around 
we went, uh, from the basic to the top and and uh, return. So okay, so why is is no problem? It's only it's the length. Okay, so it doesn't matter that it's a like a, if it sits double inside there, it must just fit in. No problem. No problem. Okay. It's only uh, you have uh, uh, enough length uh, to detect uh, enough fields. Okay, so yeah, Ross, you 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 have the the air going through the tube, and then the tube is in a a cylinder or a jug or something that's filled with a gas. Yeah, I understand that. I've got a uh, double uh, a cylinder with a double um, skin, and I fill the gans on the inside of the skin, and breathe the air out of the inside of the cylinder, which is just air. Yes, so um, it's that, but with eight meters of tubing. <laughs> yeah. Eight meters of tubing, a lot of tubing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a thinner tube. <laughs> well, the cylinder is uh, merely centimeters high and uh, ten uh, centimeters in uh, diameter. It's, it's not not great. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe the next time I can show you a, a picture, and when my my cameras work. And we make also a workshop for this uh, kind, and uh, I can give you the pictures. It's easy to to uh, to build this system. And I think the cost was for me uh, um, 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Yeah, it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think I saw one, one chap used like a milk jug or something. So he just, you know, repurposed the milk, the plastic milk jug to hold all that tubing. Yeah. Uh, at, at first, uh, I built a, a, a 10, 50 centimeter uh, a pipe and, and wind a, a little uh, a, a little pipe around, and uh, it's, it works also. But the length is is yeah very different. Too big, too long. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, that's great. Well, I use a lot of tubing. I make a lot of different things with the tubes. So much uh, easier. This, uh, what I use is uh, a sink. Normally the, the people uh, work with this when they become oxygen. You, you uh, stick this thing in the nose. You notice it's like a, a nose brill. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. And so you can work all the thing that uh, the pipe is long enough. I make from the cylinder, I have three meters out from this and so I can a little bit working and uh, can go around and, and breathe. And then you can start putting some iodine gans in there and then you can, you can Maybe. work Maybe. on this planet and somewhere else at the same time too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different variations. <laughs> Could I just ask a question, please? Yes. Well, where you mentioned uh, iodine GANs, um, I've looked on the internet for uh, like pure iodine, and I've really only come across iodine prills, like little balls. Um, how did, how did you make your iodine gans? You can make it from kelp. From kelp. That's much iodine. Okay. Like. Oh. I also used a, a, what they call Lugol solution. Okay, yeah. Hmm. How do you spell that? L U G O L S. Okay. Have very high iodine, yes. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So the. Um, but you only need a very little bit of that. <laughs> it's quite strong. Okay. Good. To begin with, at any rate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I was. Um, uh, I mean, for instance, with your with your uh, moringa gans, did you make that in uh, the, the same sort of way that you would make a food gans? Exactly the same, yes. Okay, because what I was thinking uh, with these, these these prills, these little little balls of uh, what has been classified as, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a ninety nine point nine nine percent iodine uh, in, in in mass terms, it, it, these little marbles. Um, I was thinking of maybe making an iodine gans in the same way as as a food gans, 
uh, would be made. Um, I'm sure you could. Um, I'm not sure if it is soluble in water. Um, right. So you might yeah. have to mix it with a little bit of alcohol, for example, just to to because the Lugols is is so, it sort of has a slight alcohol base. Um, right. Okay. Okay then. Um, <clears throat> one other question I have: um, where we have um, a hemoglobin of a magnesium base, and we have a nanocoated uh, and a, a nanocoated zinc uh, with uh, magnesium and rusty iron. Um, I've, I've got some pure uh, magnesium rods. Um, I, I tried to open up the atomic structure of, of one of them, and uh, that that turned into a, a smoking turbo jacuzzi. As do you know if, if anybody has has uh, has made gans of, of 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 magnesium on its own? I've done that. Um, wow. What I found is, Armin gave me a tip very early on, and he said if you want to if you want to actually make a gans of any metal, mm. um, you need two of the same metal, yes. and then if you hook them up on a positive and a negative one side will turn black and become nano when there's a slight current applied and then eventually you'll get your gans coming off because it will be nano coated by the current so you don't oh. actually have to nano coat um i've i've done my zinc this way and i've done the magnesium that way um so you yeah. can that is how you can do it okay so um i could uh I could just hook them up to a, a 1.5 volt battery. I'm surmising you might be able to. I'm not sure because I use my little power supply, but I use a very, very, I, I just get an amperage and just get a voltage on the on the power supply, and then it slowly does it. But it'll literally only start working, with, you know, like the next day almost, because it'll take a whole yeah. day to really get going. Okay, and when um and when when this was set up, um, they uh, the, the the two uh, metals uh, were in a uh, were in a salt solution, yeah. Yes. Okay then. So basically, just set it up every way that you would uh, with with uh, with uh, as though you were making a GANS, and just allow it to nano coat, and then it will start producing. Yes, that's it. And. You know, if you're wanting to do, say, a, a CO2 uh, chlorophyll GANS with a magnesium, for example, you'd set up your normal CO2 box, and then you just put a magnesium rod in between the two plates, loose, with no attachment or anything. And I've made CO2 like that as well, and it's a totally different CO2 to the normal CO2. Right. Um, it doesn't yeah. go green or anything, but it, it, it looks very different. And it feels okay, different. Right. And you would do the same thing for a for your hemoglobin. Yes. Um, I, with my hemoglobin, I just attached my um, in my CO two box. I used those little crocodile clips okay. uh, to connect the plates, and then I just allowed the crocodile clips to rust <laughs> and create oh, my okay. hemoglobin. And I wasn't quite sure if I had hemoglobin GANS, and then I tested it with Klaus's pendulum, and it is not CH3 in there because it doesn't behave the same, doesn't do the same uh, magnetical thing. It, it, it's got a different feel to the, to the motion of the pendulum. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, are there any more questions or are we going to wrap it up for today? Okay, I think we're going to leave it at that. All clear. And uh, I'll leave it up to Jimmy to close. All right, thanks for attending today. I think it was uh, quite an enlightening workshop and I think it will have... Uh, 
huge ramifications for people to uh, understand their connection to nature. It puts a lot of things in perspective for, for myself and for a lot of people. So we hope you enjoyed it and thanks for attending. And, um, and go and connect with the souls of all the plants now because now we know what to do. And now you can run out and hug your tree because now we know why we have to do that. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Thanks. Lisa and Jimmy. Thank Thanks, you, Lisa. Everybody. Thank you, Jim, and everyone else. I love you. I'll see you in bye a fortnight. Bye. Good night. <laughs>